Need some light. Good afternoon. And welcome to the Four Arts. I'm Sophia Maduro, the Chief Programs Officer here. And we're so excited to launch the first of three in the series of lectures, Tomorrow's Breakthroughs Today, the Scientific Symposium in partnership with the Alzheimer Drug Discovery Foundation with the incredibly generous support of Tom and Heidi McWilliams here in the audience and many of you on the board of ADDF. Um, just as a reminder, there is a reception afterwards just coming out of the doors. You go left out into our little um, garden there, and that will enable you to interact and talk with the doctors who are presenting today. The Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation was founded in 1998 by two much beloved members of the Four Arts, Leonard and Ronald Lauder. The organization is dedicated to developing therapeutics and biomarkers that prevent, treat, and cure Alzheimer's and related dementias. Today's lecture features a conversation with Dr. Christine Jaffe, moderated by Dr. Howard Fillett. And in order to introduce those two distinguished doctors, it is my pleasure to welcome to the stage the CEO of the ADDF, Mr. Mark Rothmeyer. And for you to just remember, there are two more in this series, February 28th and April 17th, right here in the Johnson Hall. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Sophia. I have to say, just to start, um, what a uh, honor it is to be here at the Four Arts. Uh, as you all have heard, this scientific series, it's in its third year now, uh, started by our uh, wonderful co-vice chair of our board, Tom McWilliams, and his partner in life, and some say better half, Heidi, would we agree, Heidi, um, who really started this when ADDF started spending time in Palm Beach, she said, you know, the heart of the ADDF is the science, and the science is so cutting edge, we need to bring the science to the ADDF. We've been at the Norton the last two years, and we have the wonderful opportunity now to be here at the Four Arts, so we have found a wonderful new home. So, Sophia, it is great to be partnering with you, and thank you. Um, I just want to make a couple of comments. I noted that Tom is a board member of ours. We have several other board members that are here with us today, and if they might just raise their hand so they can be acknowledged, because I may be biased, but as CEO, I think we have the best board in the world, and they are, I said, Tom McWilliams, Sharon Sager, Larry Leeds, Nancy Goods, you'll hear a little bit about her when this is at the tail end today, Bonnie Lautenberg uh, and Dave Gerson, who are here with us. They make up part of the wonderful board of uh, governors of the ADDF. Um, those of you who are here at an ADDF science series for the first time, could you just raise your hand and to see? Yeah, so great to see, and thank you, Four Arts. Um, you're really in for a treat here, um, and I cannot understate this. There has never been a more exciting time and promising time in Alzheimer's science than today. In fact, Leonard and Ronald Lauder had a slogan from about five years ago, hope is on the horizon, and Dr. Phillin and I just had breakfast with Leonard this morning at his house, and he has declared, hope is here. And as proof of that, and you'll get an insider's view right from the get-go, before the first quarter of this year is over, Eli Lilly will be announcing a full approval by the FDA for a drug that's called Denanumab. Uh, those results are just pending with the FDA, but we were just with the leadership of Eli Lilly last week, uh, and they are awaiting their date when they get to declare it is safe and potent and very effective, and you're gonna hear about that drug today. But as exciting as that is, I'm gonna say again for all of you here for the first time, you're gonna hear science today in Alzheimer's that this is the cutting edge, the leading edge, that not only here in the United States, but you can hear in the world. And as proof points to that, let me just say, you hear that the ADDF was founded by Leonard and Ronald Lauder. I wanna give you just a little bit more about that. Two sons were asked by their mother, Este, before she passed with a trust do something about Alzheimer's. Why? Because Este had Alzheimer's. Este's sister, Leonard and Ronald's aunt, had Alzheimer's. 
And she wanted her sons to do something about it that she knew was too late for her, but maybe could help the world. With that trust, her two sons went and scoured the world for what they should do. And it was somebody at the National Institutes of Health, and in fact, the National Institutes of Aging, that said to the two brothers, look, if you're going to put money in science, somebody needs to start thinking about translational science. And what they meant by that was they knew the NIH would be bringing all this money for basic science to understand how the brain worked. This is 26 years ago. Understand how the brain worked. But somebody needed to start thinking about what might treat the brain for Alzheimer's, translational science, high risk, high reward. And with that, Leonard and Ronald, with, and you'll meet in a second, Dr. Howard Fillett, the three of them, co-founded the ADDF with a couple of thoughts in mind. Number one, it would only be about science, nothing else. Number two, it would be about this high risk, high reward, take shots on goal for preventions, treatments, diagnostics. Three, they would work with anybody. And to give you a sense, at ADDF, we are a lean operation. We have 30 people, 15 PhD neuroscientists, 15 people who are not scientists to help make the foundation run. And all those 15 scientists do is scour the earth for ideas that can move from the bench into the bedside. Okay, So this is 25 years ago this all started. The next part that they were specific about is that that trust that SDA left would cover all the expenses of the ADDF so that they could say to everybody, if you give a nickel to the ADDF, all five cents go directly into scientists working on prevention, treatments, biomarkers, diagnostics. I point all that out because about a year ago, the Lauder family made an announcement that Leonard and Ronald Leonard with his two sons, Ronald with his two daughters, they put together a new $200 million trust so that for the next 15 years, the family knows that any dollar anybody in the audience gives, 100 cents on that dollar goes directly to the clinical trials you're going to hear about tonight. OK. So ADDF, a couple of claims to fame. The first PET scan that can diagnose Alzheimer's was funded by the ADDF. Second, claim to fame, the first blood test that you can take that can say you're at risk of getting Alzheimer's funded by the ADDF. And it's an interesting thing funded by the ADDF because this is the last differentiating factor. At the ADDF, we do not make grants to academics or to biotechs. We make contractual investments. And if we put a million dollar investment into this company called C2N that's come up with this blood test, any equity delivery that they get from that product, we get a percentage of that and we put it right back into the science. It's called venture philanthropy. And I only point that out because 25, 26 years ago, that was a novel idea. You hear a lot more these days about venture philanthropy, but I think it's just another aspect of the Lauder family that just cutting edge thinking of how do you go about something differently that we do. These tests now, you could in Florida tomorrow get a blood test, and Howard's going to talk about this, and it could tell you if you're at risk. And two years ago, if I were to stand up and say that in Palm Beach, people in the audience say, why would I want to know? And now there's a direct answer. You're going to hear about today from Dr. Jaffe about prevention how through lifestyle interventions, you can push out, push away the occurrence of Alzheimer's and dementia by up to 30 to 40%. You say, well, maybe I don't want to change my lifestyle. You're going to hear about today two, if not three now, with Lilly, new drugs that can treat Alzheimer's. And again, this treatment is it slows it down, it pushes it out, it delays it, OK? And that may be exciting, but I told you that you're going to get the cutting edge of the cutting edge. You're going to hear about today what comes after these drugs. Because you'll hear from Howard, 30 to 35 percent effective. Oh, that's terrific. But at the ADDF, we need to see 60 percent, 70 percent, 100 percent. 
and we are funding preventions, combined therapies, and precision medicine. So if you think just the way you think about cancer and how that's treated, this is the course that the, um, the treatment of Alzheimer's is on, but more importantly, and this is why this is a special group today, this is the leading science in the world. The CEO of Lilly wants to meet with us. The CEO of Biogen wants to meet with us because this is the science that we're driving. Okay, so enough of all of that. Let, let's get on with the, the two main speakers. It is my pleasure now to bring on stage Dr. Howard Fillett. He is the co-founder and the chief science officer of the ADDF. He has spent his lifetime working on Alzheimer's. He is a physician scientist. Uh, he has worked in academia and industry and now philanthropy. You need to know that he was Estes concierge doc 30 years ago. He was the person that Leonard and Ronald went to and said, hey, we talked to somebody at the NIH and they're saying like translational science and venture philanthropy. What do you think about that, Howard? He goes, oh, that's spot on. That's exactly what needs to be done. He wasn't ready for the question that came the next day, which was, Howard, give up your job in industry, keep your concierge practice, but come lead this and run this for us. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Dr. Howard Phillip. Well, first let me thank Mark and, uh, and all of you for coming here today. I hope we have a, a great session. Um, today we're gonna to talk about prevention. Uh, let me elaborate a little bit on what's enabled prevention that uh, Mark mentioned. <clears throat> that is that we helped to develop this brain scan, which we started funding about 20, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, we were very early investors in it. And um, what it can do is it can actually see the Alzheimer's disease in the brain. So you go for a PET scan, just like you would for any other disease like cancer. You inject a dye, it goes up into the brain, it binds the plaques that are characteristic of the disease, and it lights up on a PET scan. And so this was initially used for clinical trials to make sure that people that went into the clinical trials actually had Alzheimer's disease, uh, especially because the clinical trials initially were directed at removing the amyloid protein, which is characteristic of the disease, from the brain as a therapeutic target. And what Lilly found when they bought the company that we helped to establish uh, that had this test was that 30, 35% of the people being enrolled in clinical trials for Alzheimer's with an anti-amyloid drug did not have an amyloid in their brain and they did not have Alzheimer's disease. And so failures could be attributed to this um, fact that many of the people in the trials were the wrong people. And that's really changed the world because now we can do really precision trials even with a blood test that we've also invested in through a company called C2N, which has probably the best blood test on the market now in 49 states that's just not, still waiting for approval in New York. <laughs> the, which has the most strict regulatory environment for, for these kinds of things. Um, but what it also did, what the, blood, what the brain scan did was, it enabled prevention. And the reason is that what, what researchers started doing was scanning people who were normal in the community and finding out that just like with heart disease, the plaques in your coronary arteries may start when you're 20 years old, but you might not have your first heart attack till you're 70. <clears throat> uh, in Alzheimer's, what the brain scan showed was there were many people living in the community that had the disease in their brain without symptoms. And so now you have a potential population that could be um, treated and prevented. And so there are currently clinical trials going on where this is exactly what's happening in prevention, which is very, very precise, what we call precision prevention. Identify the people that have preclinical disease, no symptoms, but they have the illness in their brain through these brain scans and even through their blood tests, and then start treating them to see if you can prevent or delay the onset of the disease. And it's been documented through uh, various means of modeling that if we could delay the onset of out, the clinical onset of Alzheimer's symptoms and dementia by just five years, we would reduce the number of people suffering from dementia by 50%. And that would obviously be a huge impact and a great, thing, a great benefit to, to all of us to be able to do that so that we could you know, literally die with our minds uh, intact and be able to enjoy our, our old age. 
The, but the other thing that's really been incredible in prevention is the kind of work <coughs> that Dr. Jaffe is doing um, in looking at how lifestyle and uh, other factors can really affect prevention. And uh, I just want to move this over to Dr. Jaffe. Let me introduce her first. Um, she's been a good friend for many years, and um, she's the Scola Endowed Chair and Vice Chair, Professor of Psychiatry, Neurology, and Epidemiology, and Director of the Center for Population Brain Health at the University of California in San Francisco. And she's dedicated her career uh, to prevention research. And um, we've been working with her uh, in the past on various mechanisms of trying to understand what the predisposing factors are in lifestyle and other comorbidities uh, could contribute to the onset of Alzheimer's disease. So let me start off by asking uh, Dr. Jaffe, um, first of all, it's been said in recent work that I know you've been involved in that there's you know 12 or so maybe major risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. and including things like ec lack of exercise and smoking and alcohol and depression and abnormal sleep or not getting sleep um, and, and uh, lack of social stimulation and engagement and so on. Um, um, and there was a report that came out, both you and others have said that if we could reduce these risk factors, we would reduce the number of cases by 40%. So how optimistic are you that with proper implementation, which is the real challenge, I guess, and the clinical study that you ran to try to prove that prevention actually works, how optimistic are you that, that through widespread education and maybe through changes in our healthcare system, we would actually be able to prevent Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, right, um, through lifestyle and drugs com combined together, like we do in heart disease where we have lifestyle education and statins? just ask 20 questions, but I'll, I'll try I'll try and answer them all. Um, I'm delighted to, to, to be here and uh, share with you um, some of our work and, and what I think is truly very exciting. So um, the premise which, which you mentioned is that if we could change people's risk factors, um, whether it's their high blood pressure or their sleep or exercise, diet, um, all, a number of things, that we could really move the needle on a, on a population level, okay? So if you could get people to change 10%, 25%, um, then the downstream effect could be enormous. And so we're very excited about that, but that's really theoretical. What I've been interested in, how do we, how do we take that knowledge and then roll it out into a real world kind of trial to see if it really works? And so we just finished a trial where we, we took people, these were normal people. They did not have dementia. They were normal people. They were 70 or older. They had a couple risk factors that we said we can't intervene unless they have a couple things to change. So they had a couple risk factors. And, otherwise, and they wanted to be in the trial, and that was it. And then what we did was we took half of the group, and they got educational materials. Um, we sent them all kinds of materials about these risk factors. And the other half of the group, we actually worked with them. We said, we're gonna make this kind of personal. And we said, okay, would, you have these risk factors, what do you wanna work on? And somebody might say, well, I wanna work on my sleep. A lot of people wanted to work on being more physically active. And then we worked with them. We had a health coach and we set goals and we asked them how they wanted to work on it. Did they want to go to a class? Did they want to have a Fitbit to monitor? Did they want to, you know, how did they want to do it? So we tried to make it as personal as possible. And lo and behold, we followed them for two years. Now, meanwhile, COVID hit, so it was really challenging because a lot of those same risk factors got, got worse in the setting of COVID. We're isolated, we're, we're, we're not able to go to the doctor, we're not able to see our friends, et cetera. Nonetheless, at the end of the two years, we found that those people who got this personalized intervention, it, reducing their risk factors, they were much, much better in terms of the cognitive testing than the, than the education control group. On the order of difference of, of about 75% better. So it was a huge effect. And what we also saw was that the risk factors got better too. 
So it sort of went along with our hypothesis. And there were other outcomes that, that did better too. So we're very excited about this. And as you said, we really think the next frontier, now that we have these wonderful new drugs emerging, we want to put them together. It, it doesn't make sense that you just do risk factors or lifestyles or drugs. Let's bring them together to see how they work together and to get a much more effective outcome. So we're, we're really excited about this, and um, we're looking forward to the next steps. So, so changing the system is not, just educating people is not enough. Correct. I think just, as, I mean, I know I'm supposed to exercise more, and you know, uh, how do you actually put it into play? Um, some, we're all different. So I think uh, what motivates one person might be different than what motivates another. I think um, we need education. Brain health is one of those things that people don't really think much about. People don't even know that the heart health is connected to the brain. Um, a lot of doctors don't even know this. And so I, I do think there's a role for education, absolutely. But I don't think education is enough to always change your behavior. So, so in your SMART trial, how did you, basically it's compliance, I guess, is kind of the issue. How do, you can advise people to exercise, but you want them to comply over a long period sure. of time. And many of these risk factors are midlife risk factors. And it's interesting that we know Alzheimer's probably starts in midlife in the brain until 20, 25 years later when people are 75, they become symptomatic. Yep. So how do, how do we implement some of this, you know, like hypertension or diabetes might be midlife risk factors. I've always thought that if I tell my patients to eat a, you know, good diet, low salt, and all this, and they're 40, they'll say, well, you know, not so much. But if I said to them, this could prevent Alzheimer's, we might have more of an impact. But how do we implement compliance? Yeah, I, I mean, again, you 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 pack a lot in your questions there. Uh, I think one of the interesting, um, one of very very powerful message is that what you do over your whole life could influence your brain health. And don't wait till you're in your 80s or 90s um, because you've missed a, a tremendous opportunity. It, it, what I say is it's never too late, but it's never too early. So it, this idea that um, earlier, particularly midlife, is probably a really critical time. Um, you mentioned that just like atherosclerosis, uh, we think that what's, Alzheimer's disease probably takes decades to develop in terms of the proteins laying down, some of the neurons changing. Um, so it, it, that's a, a little overwhelming. On the other hand, it, it provides us with a lot of opportunity. So if it takes that long, well, then there are lots of points you could intervene. And I think midlife is a really important time where you can really try and change some of these behaviors. I my my. My bet is that one of these days we will have drugs for midlife, uh, we'll have uh, uh, risk reduction strategies, and, and that will be a very, very exciting. First we have to, first we have to show that they work in, in, in older people at risk, but then I think we'll be able to do it earlier. You know, and a simple thing is it's pretty clear, I think, you'd agree that hypertension is a risk factor for cognitive decline, <laughs> uh, brain shrinkage with aging, neurodegeneration. <coughs> um, the average time that people take antihypertensives for their hypertension is 275 days. Um, so how do we get people to take their antihypertensives when we know that, for example, among the 12 or whatever main risk factors that have been identified, hypertension is probably one of the most powerful ones. And I feel like if I say to my patient, you know, take your antihypertensive, it'll prevent a heart attack. Well, you know, that's a ways off. But if I say this is for your brain mm -hmm. health, maybe I have a stronger message. Yeah, I, I agree. Hypertension is, um, there was a big trial a few years ago that actually showed that if you were aggressive with your blood pressure treatment, you could prevent dementia and mild cognitive impairment. So I, I agree with you. Um, if, if, you're, if you try and get people to make that connection with whatever it is in the brain, it's more motivating. Um, and we need to, we need to I think we need to tackle this both in terms of a public health campaign. Um, the CDC is now rolling out, and I was part of the, the program to develop this. They're working with state public health departments and trying to teach people about brain health with the exact theory that if you can motivate people to make these changes and learn about it, that maybe it will work. 
Yes, so mo most of the data on these risk factors come from epidemiological studies, <clears throat> which look at big databases of people and see associations. So you might see an association of hypertension diagnosis with late, you know, years later perhaps, a diagnosis of dementia, and it, that's how we do risk. But what you did was actually a randomized clinical trial, the highest standard of evidence, um, to show that prevention works. And of course, if I can mention, one of our board members and your colleague and mine, Mia Kivapelto, also did a similar sort of uh, study with five major risk factors, um, which are uh, vascular, social, um, diet, exercise, and, and maintaining integration. I think I left one out. But um, her studies are being replicated through what's called the worldwide finger in 60 countries around the world. So prevention is really becoming the, 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 the fact that we can prevent this, I think, is becoming more widely accepted. What I think there's, there's a bit of a gap in is how does this work? Um, for example, exercise. You know, how does, how do, we know exercise is a powerful risk factor in a positive way that if people exercise, that they can help their brain health, and if they're sedentary, it's bad for your brain. But why do you think, how do you think exercise works to be a, uh, let's say, if you do exercise, it's good for your brain, and if you don't, it's bad for your brain. Yeah, so um, that is an area I think we need more on, which is understanding the mechanisms with all of these. Some have been studied well. I think physical ac activity pretty well. Uh, sleep has been a really interesting area, but some haven't been studied so well, so we, we do need some more uh, s science and evidence. In terms of physical activity, we, we think that it's probably a couple things. One is um, it does reduce atherosclerosis. It does improve your blood flow. So there's something through the vascular channel itself. And then we also think that um, when people exercise, there's actually some growth factors that are released, in particular something called brain-derived growth factor, BDNF. So it's really interesting that something about exercise actually is healthy for the brain. It, it fosters new connections and, and is, is actually makes the, the neurons healthier. So I think it's a couple different pathways, but it's, uh, we know, for example, that the hippocampus gets bigger. The hippocampus is a very important part of the brain that's involved in memory and learning. And if you look at people before they exercise and then maybe after six months of exercising, the hippocampus actually grows, which is fantastic. So this idea, I think, one of the most important things to, to, for all of us to understand is the brain is plastic. In other words, it continues to grow and change. And, and it, something like exercise is, is really perfect for that. And you know, we can learn from that kind of thing. When, when I presented the trial that you sort of alluded to, which showed that the hippocampus, which is where Alzheimer's disease starts, <clears throat> uh, that, that exercise can actually, after six months, in people that do the exercise, the hippocampus is bigger, their memories are better, people's memories are better. Uh, I presented this, the results of the trial we funded um, to the board, and one of my board members said, well, Howard, that's terrific, but I'm a couch potato. Can you please make a pill out of this? And um, I said to him, that's exactly what we're doing, because you mentioned BDNF, which is probably the most powerful neuroprotective factor in the body to protect neurons from injury. And we're working with uh, Frank Longo for many years now to develop a drug based on BDNF, and uh, that drug is just starting to move towards the clinic now. So we, what I'm saying is it's not just looking at these associations, finding risk factors, understanding how the risk factors work to prevent Alzheimer's, but then learning from that mechanism to develop new drugs. Mm -hmm. Um, what about diet? I mean, we hear a lot about the Mediterranean diet, and diet is always part of these prevention efforts, um, vegetables, fruit, nuts. I mean, why, is, why is that good for the brain? How does that work? Yeah, I, I think diet is something that hasn't received as much attention and probably should. Um, the evidence is, is pretty good that uh, Mediterranean diet seems to be better for your heart and also for your brain. I'm not sure we totally understand the mechanisms. Uh, probably some antioxidants, so it, it reduces inflammation. We know inflammation is very um, integrally involved with, with Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative diseases. So it's probably along that pathway. Um, 
and, you know, in addition to atherosclerosis and et cetera. You've mentioned sleep a number of times, and um, I guess there's different aspects to the sleep risk factor. Um, we know sleep changes, the sleep patterns change with age. So something called sleep latency, the amount of time it takes to fall asleep um, is increased. So people get very upset that it's taking them longer to fall asleep. So they start themselves on Ambien or other sleep products, which in my practice, people come in and they have memory problems. They're complaining. The wife is saying his memory isn't so good. And I take down the list of their drugs and they're on Ambien. And I tell them, you got to stop that because it, it has a negative effect. And there's epidemiological evidence that these sleep products actually are risk factors for cognitive impairment. <clears throat> but, um, you know, there's sleep apnea, which I guess is related to low oxygen. And then there's the lack of sleep, which has a fundamental and critical process for life, right? If you don't sleep, you die, basically. We torture people by not letting them sleep. Um, so, so how does sleep work? Like, yeah. why is sleep a risk factor? How does, you know, we talked about autophagy, the process of removing, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't want to steal your thunder on this one, but, but, you know, we talked about how sleep has a biological role, which might be related to dementia, there's sleep apnea, and other yeah. aspects to it. Sure, so I actually think uh, sleep is one of the most fascinating things uh, in the last 10 years that, that we've understood. Nobody knew, why did we spend a third of our time in sleep? Nobody knew. And now we, we think we understand that when we sleep, the brain is quiescent and it's resting and it allows several different systems to sort of clear out the toxins. So it's a really interesting hypothesis and if you take there's some beautiful work done in animal models where if you if you don't let the animals sleep or you you disrupt their sleep you actually see greater accumulation of tau and amyloid the key proteins in alzheimer's disease so therefore this idea is that if you can improve sleep maybe you can can benefit uh, your, your risk of developing Alzheimer's. And there's a lot of interest in this now. Sleep apnea is a little different. Sleep apnea, sleep disordered breathing, very common. Um, we were actually the first to show this link with, with um, Alzheimer's disease. We think it's driven by the low oxygen, and therefore it's very important to, to use CPAP. The problem with CPAP is it's, it's terribly inconvenient and, and uncomfortable, and so there are some new strategies, hopefully, to, to treat sleep apnea that I think will be very effective. But I think sleep is a fascinating, fascinating area. We're, we're finally, there's a number of trials now both for sleep apnea and also for just improving your sleep um, that are, are now being conducted. So I think we'll know a lot more in the next few years. And I think we can all relate to sleep because when we don't get sleep, or if we only get four hours or something, we feel terrible the next day and it's foggy and you know that's an immediate impact. Mm -hmm. Imagine that's happening to you every day for years. It's neurodegeneration. Um, a couple of other risk factors that we've spoken about. Um, one is hearing loss. We've heard that, and, and it's been published that hearing loss is a risk factor for cognitive impairment and dementia. Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, um, hearing loss and, and um, sensory loss in general, I think, um, I have a former postdoc who's done a lot of work in this area, and it, it's complicated. I think there, there um, there's two paths. One is, if you can't hear or you can't see, um, it, you know, it, it gets in the way of what you can do. You're maybe more isolated. Uh, you're not going to seek out going to restaurants and various things as much. So there's a piece that might be kind of behavioral, um, not able to hear. If you can't hear things, it doesn't get in. Um, but the other thing that's really interesting is that we're starting to understand there may be some shared pathways between both uh, vision and hearing and neurodegenerative diseases. So it's really exciting because we, we there was a big trial just finished um, six months ago where they actually used hearing aids. And they said, okay, if you use hearing aids versus not hearing aids, do you actually see differences in cognition? And it was a bit of a complicated answer, but it, but at the end of the day, it looked like hearing aids really did decrease your, your cognitive changes compared to having hearing loss and not using the hearing aids. Yeah. Um, what about traumatic brain injury? We hear a lot about that, and 
it would seem like early life traumatic brain injury, you know, children playing soccer or um, you know, uh, NFL football players would be at greater risk in late life of Alzheimer's disease. Is there any data on that or do you think that traumatic brain injury is a risk factor for dementia in late life? Yeah, um, it's an area where we're very much working on in, in partnership with um, the DOD in, in particular, for example. The Department of Defense. Department of Defense is very interested and very concerned. Um, TBI, traumatic brain injury, is another one that I don't think has gotten as much attention, but there's been a lot of focus on CTE, which is this idea that if you have these repetitive head injuries, there is um, accumulation of, of tau, one of, again, one of those key proteins, and that that seems to be associated, unfortunately, with some of these um, profiles where people are changes in their behavior, changes in their thinking, and unfortunately, at, at autopsy, uh, people can look in the brain and see these changes. The question is, well, what about for all of us, you know, uh, people who aren't NFL players but who actually had a traumatic brain injury in a car accident or what have you. And it looks like it does increase your, list, your risk a little bit. We have to try and get to the bottom of what might be causing that. I actually don't think it's Alzheimer's disease. I think it may be uh, another form of dementia. Uh, from from work we've done and, and others, when we look at the biomarkers and we look at the, the different profile, I don't think it's Alzheimer's, but I do think it does increase your risk for developing other kinds of dementia. Um, it's been said that women are at greater risk than men. So is, is being a woman a risk factor? Do you think that women are at greater risk? Um, I mean, obviously, women live longer, and um, or we live shorter, men live shorter, uh, for whatever reason. Um, but uh, is, is, is gender a risk factor? So I can say that, um, you know, all, 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 with all due respect, in many ways, Alzheimer's is a woman's disease. Yes. And that's because uh, women live longer, right? They live longer, so they're going to get more age-related diseases. So that's number one. Number two, caregivers are usually women. So it, it's, um, you know, it, it affects women disproportionately. The question is, if you account for age, do women get more Alzheimer's? You know, if you, if you say everybody's living the same, um, that's less clear. That's less clear. Maybe a little bit uh, of an increased risk, not huge. And there's questions about, you know, is it related to hormones, of course? Um, is it, there was a long time, long period where it looked like estrogen might be beneficial. Now that's controversial. But there's some other evidence that maybe the way the, proteins work in the brain is slightly different in women versus men. Still a very interesting area that I, I don't think we totally understand. Uh, you know, we talked about hypertension a little bit earlier, and 65, 70% of people over 65 have hypertension. And so, and the SPRINT trial that, we, that you alluded to actually showed that treatment of, of hypertension, even in old age, can be preventative of uh, dementia and uh, stroke, obviously. Uh, or vascular dementia, which is perhaps the second most common cause of dementia in old age. And many people, about 50% of people that you and I see in the community, have mixed what we call mixed dementia, which is a combination of Alzheimer's plus um, vascular disease that affects the neurons and you know tiny little strokes and things like that. Um, but the other really potent uh, risk factor that I think has emerged is diabetes, and about 30% of people over 65 have diabetes, so it's very common. And I think the evidence right now for diabetes as a risk factor for cognitive decline is pretty compelling. Um, what, what about diabetes as yeah. a risk factor, particularly type 2 diabetes? Um, yeah. I, I, um, I had colleagues who actually referred to Alzheimer's as type 3 diabetes. Uh, and, and the idea is that it, it's, again, so interesting. The science is so interesting because it turns out that Insulin is, is in the brain, of course, and it turns out that there's enzymes that, that, um, that uh, work on insulin. Well, those same enzymes actually work on amyloid, too. So if, you, if your enzymes that, that work on insulin aren't working as well, which happens in, in diabetes, 
it affects the amyloid. And so the amyloid is increasing more than it should be. So it's really interesting. And I think, um, again, it's an area we, we need a lot more research and, and investigation. But I think uh, diabetes is clearly a risk factor for, for Alzheimer's disease, as well as for vascular or this mixed mixed thing. Um, and again, I think, uh, you know, there's been a couple trials, the metformin trials and um, insulin administered through the nose, and they've been sort of mixed bag, I think. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't said this much today, but um, of course, we try to translate all these risk factors into therapies, and mm -hmm. we support a Su Suzanne Kraft, who did the first intranasal insulin, mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, and we've supported Jose Luxinger mm -hmm. at Columbia to do a metformin trial for Alzheimer's disease, and a Paul Edison at the Imperial College of London to do a trial of liraglutide, mm -hmm. which was a precursor to Ozempic, now being studied in one billion dollar clinical trial to see if Ozempic can be uh, a drug for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease, because as we age, we lose the metabolic ability to use glucose, which is the major source of energy for the brain. The brain is 2% of the body weight and uses 20, 25% of the body's energy at any given time. So insulin resistance in the brain can lead to neurodegeneration, and it's very possible, I think, that Ozempic will turn out to be not only the first drug for obesity and very effective for diabetes, but also possibly for Alzheimer's. And once you start getting into these multiple comorbidities, as one drug can treat multiple comorbidities in, in several organs, including renal, renal disease and so on, mm -hmm. that Ozempic could ultimately be the first FDA-approved anti-aging drug because of the way it works. What about depression? We, you and I have talked about depression as a risk factor, and whether it's a prodrome or somehow a risk factor. Yeah, um, so depression is very interesting in that people haven't looked so much at depression in terms of Alzheimer's and whether it's a risk factor. We think that it's probably, again, there's two pathways. One, when people start having changes in the brain, um, sometimes they it manifests as behavioral changes or maybe depression. And so one way that depression could be connected to Alzheimer's is because it's a what we call a prodrome. It's an early sign of, of something that's happening in the brain. The other possibility is that depression actually is a risk factor. And we don't know exactly why that is. I, th I think it, it seems that both are, are true. But um, uh, it seems that depression somehow, and we don't know, is it, is it somehow changes in the hippocampus? So depression sometimes uh, reduces the size of the hippocampus. Maybe that's part of it. Maybe there's vascular changes. I don't think we really know. Yeah. Um, sort of getting to the future, we have blood tests on the market now for Alzheimer's. If you asked me five years ago if there'd ever be a blood test for Alzheimer's, I would say no. There's never been a blood test for any neurodegenerative disease because we think the brain is protected by the blood-brain barrier and there's not a lot of leakage of, blood, of brain proteins into the blood to measure. But with technological advantage, like really hypersensitive uh, methods for detecting proteins in the blood. We now have blood tests on the market available in 49 states. So how do you think the availability and Quest is having these tests and LabCorp has these tests? And then, right now they're not the best tests. The best tests are probably other tests that are out there like C2N, the C2N test. But do you think that, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the workflow of medicine, um, for example, we measure cholesterol. And if somebody's got a high cholesterol, they've got hypercholesterolemia, they're at risk for heart disease, we put them on a statin, we measure the cholesterol, it goes down, everybody's happy, the patient doesn't feel any different. But we say to them, um, oh, if you take this statin, you know, in five or 10 years, you'll be one in 150 people who will have a prevented heart attack. And people are compliant because you're using that biomarker, the blood test, to keep people compliant. So do you think with the advent of blood tests that we, we already have on the market, that this will change the way we practice prevention for Alzheimer's? I'll t maybe test somebody in their 40s or 50s and say you've got elevated tau in your blood and your amyloid ratio is abnormal, indicative of early Alzheimer's, and we want you to go on um, Dr. Jaffe's prevention program. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I think 100% sure that this is, that, that the field of 
Alzheimer's is going to change because of these biomarkers. Absolutely. And it's really exciting because we're going to be able to say, oh, you know, Mark, don't worry. You don't have Alzheimer's because we did the blood test, so it's really unlikely. Or Mark, you know, we're concerned you might have higher risk, so we're going to recommend these three things. And we could even track over time to see if what you're doing changes those. So I do think, I think the field is going to really change. And I think it's exciting because we're going to finally have a, a cholesterol, if you will, and then we'll be able to track it and be able to tell, you know, reassure people if it's low, uh, motivate people and, and, and find good treatments for people if it's high. Please, uh, people with the mics, just raise your hand, they'll come to you. That's wonderful, thank you. I have three very short questions. Okay, one, the numbers for hypertension, the both diastolic and systolic pressures, were suggested a few years ago to be changed. Very few doctors seem to follow those numbers. That's number one. Number two, are plaques the culprit? You are obviously convinced that that is. I've read so much research that said that plaques may not, in fact, be the culprit, but maybe the secondary manifestation of a deeper of a deeper issue. And three, intermittent fasting and autophagy. So we have to remember these three questions, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. What was your first question? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, um, you want me to take the first one, yeah, and then yeah. you, you, I'll, we'll, you know. Okay. Now I'll really confuse you. Yeah. Um, I'll take the third one first. Okay. Uh, in terms of <clears throat> blood pressure, and, and yes, I, both for blood pressure and for diabetes, the guidelines have changed. So it's a good thing, but it makes it harder. Um, so it used to be that the number was 140 over 90, the systolic was 140, and now it's, it's, it's gone to 125, and uh, 120 even, and so um, not every... Excuse me, what has it gone to now? Uh, 120 for the, for the top one, and, and the, the bottom one is still 90 pretty much, but some people like to be 80. Um, and so the sprint trial we were talking about, that's what they did. They, they tried to go for the, the, the more aggressive treatment, and that's where they found benefit, so uh, going for those. So um, again, it, it's, it's good news in that I think we can be more aggressive. We don't know if that's true for everybody. And just like everything in medicine, you have to balance the positives with the negatives. So some people are very sensitive to medications, they're very sensitive to if the blood pressure goes too low, they might faint. Right. So you have to, everybody's different. But in general, we're trying to be more aggressive with the blood pressure as well as the, the sugar levels. And the other question? Uh, yeah, so the plaques has become an interesting uh, issue. I think there was always this controversy about the real role of plaques, <clears throat> the amyloid plaques, which, by the way, Alzheimer's, when he saw them for the first time in 1906, called them senile plaques. And what's turned out is that they're not just amyloid plaques, but there's probably a couple of hundred different proteins in the plaques. But somehow, if you use these new drugs, they remove the plaques. And we can see that on the brain scan. So the, the critical question really is not whether it's primary, which it is in some genetic forms of Alzheimer's, or secondary to things like inflammation with aging, which inflammation is like a leading target now. We're very invested in anti-inflammatory drugs for Alzheimer's because the brain becomes inflamed. Part of the inflammation is from the plaque, so you get a vicious cycle. But the, the ultimate question is therapeutic targets. And the, and the ultimate question on the role of amyloid and the plaques in Alzheimer's is if you treat it and you get rid of it, does it work? And what these new drugs are showing is, yes, it works, but it only works about 30%. In other words, it only slows it down about 30%. And there's been a lot of discussion in the field among experts, is that clinically meaningful? So at 12 months or 18 months, what, what do you gain? And I would say, 
in the 18 month trials, it's been shown that you gain about five months of cognitive life expectancy, let's say, cognitive benefit. Many people will remain stable over these 18 months, which is not characteristic of a disease that's a progressive, you know, chronic progressive, uniformly fatal neurodegenerative illness. Most people will decline. So if I said to you, if you take this drug, you'll be stable for, let's say, an extra year over a couple of years of taking it, or maybe we have stopping rules. Would you want to do that if you were 80 years old? And I said to you, you could recognize your grandchildren for an extra year, and there are side effects, but we can manage the side effects. If I said to you, you have cancer, and I can give you an extra year of life, but your hair's going to fall out, and you're going to vomit, you know, would you take that drug? And you would. So I think the Alzheimer's drugs as they are today are actually better than many of the cancer drugs in terms of risk benefit. We're preserving what makes us all human for a certain period of time, and it's just the beginning. Because 75% for the first time, 75% of the drugs that are being investigated are non-amyloid drugs. And that's been what we've been doing for 25 years because we recognize that by far the leading risk factor for Alzheimer's is aging. And as a geriatrician and someone who studied aging, there are so many pathways that we could address, which we are addressing in our foundation, to address these pathways of aging as they relate to Alzheimer's disease. And I'll turn to you for the uh, Intermittent fasting. fasting. I just wanted to say that I think one way we're kind of addressing that is with drugs like metformin and yep. rapamycin, which mimic, they're drugs that mimic intermittent fasting, and they're being studied now in Alzheimer's. As I mentioned, we're funding a large prevention trial combining metformin with these uh, lifestyle interventions uh, in Sweden at this time uh, to see what the added benefit of, of, a, of a drug that kind of mimics intermittent fasting uh, with the lifestyle. But yeah, I, I would just add, um, I don't think we know exactly about intermittent fasting. It, there's theoretical reasons why it might be beneficial um, in terms of reducing inflammation and, and, and uh, um, uh, glucose um, tolerance, et cetera. But I, I don't think there's any s real evidence that I know of. But, but I think maybe some of these studies that Howard mentioned will, will be helpful. It's been mostly shown in mice. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Um, I think it's, it's really special to be able to hear you from the, on the front lines. I am aware that there is a new treatment called focused ultrasound, and I wondered if you could speak about that and how effective you think it will be. They, they've approached our foundation uh, for an investment um, on, on a few occasions, and, and, and we've declined. And um, Christine and I were talking about this. You know, focused ultrasound is a form of energy that can kill cells. So if you have a tumor, it's right here, you focus the energy and you kill the tumor. That makes sense to me. If you had, um, talking with somebody yesterday, if you had what's called essential tremor, and we know now where that might be uh, amenable to this kind of energy, use focus ultrasound, it might improve your tremor. Alzheimer's disease is a disease that spreads throughout the brain. What focus ultrasound, what they want to do is open up the blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier exists to protect the brain from all the stuff that's in the blood. That is like pouring coffee on your computer. You know, it's just messing it up. Um, so the, those two things, you don't want to chronically open up the blood-brain barrier, even though it might have benefit in increasing the amount of drug that we can get in on an IV infusion. Um, but also, what we've seen data on, and I think this was on the 60 Minutes segment, is that it just shows benefit in a certain region of the brain. If you remember those pictures of the brain scan, which actually looked at where the amyloid was, that's, that's the test we helped to develop 25 years ago. That PET scan, most of the red part where the amyloid was, was not affected because they only could do one little part. So it's unclear whether the economics of this technology, the safety of this technology, the potential benefit of having to go to every time you're administered with an IV infusion, which is aggressive enough, you have to put this thing on your head and get the focused ultrasound. <clears throat> so it's kind of interesting, but I don't think it's ever gonna have widespread use in our field. Lots of people now are taking these injections to reduce their weight what are the implications of that widespread usage for preventing Alzheimer's 
in the absence of anything else. Do you want to take that? Sure. Um, I think Howard mentioned that it may be, th th these medications are, are very powerful for weight loss, for diabetes. And one of the questions is whether they might actually have broader effects in terms of aging, um, things r related to met metabolic changes. Um, and I think, uh, as Howard mentioned, there's now a, what, $1 billion trial to look at those in terms of Alzheimer's um, treatment in, in, in people with very early Alzheimer's. So it may be, it, it makes a lot of sense biologically why that might be, but I'm not sure we have any, um, uh, that we have enough data to, to suggest that yet, but I think in a few years we will. Um, I wanted to share my experience with trying to find a doctor who would administer the C2N blood test. I've approached two different neurologists, one um, here in Palm Beach Gardens, Dr. Silvers, and he dismissed the test and said there are too many false negatives and too many false positives. I even went to another neurologist at the Cleveland Clinic, and he also um, didn't want to administer the C2N test. And I wondered what your comment was. Well, this, the C2N test was entered into a bake-off with all the other tests that are being <laughs> commercialized now. Uh, that was uh, organized by the National Institute of Health. And the C2N test on repeated occasion was determined to be the best test we have. Um, the test is not an all or none thing. It's, it is on a gradation of results. The, the, um, the test tells you your risk, and it tells you whether or not um, you have amyloid in your brain. I think a lot of doctors have a very nihilistic approach to the diagnosis and treatment of people with dementia. Um, they, they still feel that there's nothing that can be done and that there's no reason to diagnose it. Um, and, you know, that's, as, as Mark mentioned, that's changed. I mean, we've been fighting this battle. I've been fighting this battle for 40 years. Doctors don't want to bother diagnosing Alzheimer's. <clears throat> they feel there's nothing that can be done. I think you heard a lot about what can be done with lifestyle. We have drugs on the market, and now we have these anti-amyloid drugs that work. Now, it's always up to the patient whether they want to take it or not uh, in consultation with the doctor. But I think there are still many neurologists that have a very nihilistic point of view about getting a definitive diagnosis. And I think all patients with potential Alzheimer's deserve a definitive diagnosis because it can help them with care planning. I believe it has prognostic value. And it can help them, if they want, to get into a clinical trial. The question is not whether the test is good or not. The question is how widespread and under what conditions and guidelines should the test be used. And I personally, and also the company is just sort of in the, in the stage of commercialization where they're setting up their marketing and their, uh, their commercialization in individual practices. So you're not going to find a lot of doctors at this time who are able to, you know, who know how to do the test in terms of what kind of package to put it in on dry eyes, send it to the lab in St. Louis and things like that. It's kind of a pain. And so they, they don't want to do it in the first place, and they don't want to have the pain of having to bother with administering the way it's done. But my personal practice, patients come to see me after they've been to the neurologist, and the neurologist has given them a nihilistic point of view and said, there's nothing you can do, why bother? And they come to me, and I give them a definitive diagnosis, and we work out a care plan. We talk about the clinical trials that are going on. There's about 140 of them going on. And what we can do and what it's going to look like and people are grateful. So I think people with Alzheimer's disease, just like any other patient in, in a practice, deserves a definitive diagnosis as a first step in managing this deadly disease. Howard, this is fantasy. We would take, uh, we take uh, protective measures with tetanus, measles, smallpox, Flu. Can you? We, we now have drugs that can reduce the time level, delay the time level, 20, 30, 35 percent. Let's assume that that gets approved over the years. Do you envision conceptually that there may be a standard, a standard injection or a standard course of pills that everybody takes uh, 
to prevent or to, to, certainly to, to delay uh, Alzheimer's. Well, so the, the question is, I guess, um, in, in prevention, you, you, you're asking if there's a simpler way to do it with pills and so on. Um, let me just say first that <clears throat> we've shown that these vaccines, they're what, call, what are called passive vaccines, so you have to have the infusion. Uh, they work, they work, but you have to go to the infusion center right now twice a month. Uh, if the Lilly drug gets approved, which we think it will, it's once a month. Um, they're infusions, they can have serious side effects, uh, which are manageable, but they can be serious. Imagine if there was a vaccine that you could take, say, when you're 40 or 50, that would induce these antibodies and prevent it, and you'd only have to get the vaccine once. That would be an ideal world. There are companies now that, just like we have vaccines, as you mentioned, for pneumonia and so on, there are companies now that are developing what are called active vaccines, which means you get the injection once, and it builds up your immunity to the amyloid internally, instead of having to give it through an infusion as a, as an, as a drug product, uh, you build up your immunity internally, and hopefully these clinical trials with the active vaccines will work in patients that have the disease to remove the amyloid, and then I think it'll roll into prevention. But there will be drugs, there'll be pills that we'll be able to take. First we'll show it in people that have the disease, and then we'll back into uh, people that want to prevent the disease, just like statins. The first statins were approved for people that had their first heart attack to prevent a second one, mm -hmm. but now their mi widest use is to prevent that first heart attack. And I think that's, that's where our field will go uh, in, in the future. I don't know if you have any. Hi. Hi. Oops. Hi. Thank you so much um, for all of your information. I think you've answered most of the questions that I have. But um, my darling mother-in-law, who died at 70 from Alzheimer's, and then she had a niece or someone that was 45. And um, so I want to talk about hereditary, which you mentioned. But I worry about my two children and how much they would need to be concerned about that. One is 35, the other one's 28. Uh, so can you touch on the hereditary part of this, which? I think you were talking about this last night. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so um, the hereditary nature is, is, is a bit complicated. There, there's a very rare kind of Alzheimer's, and I, I don't know if, if that was true in your family or not, um, where people get Alzheimer's quite young, in their 40s, late 30s, 40s. And that Alzheimer's is familial in that it, if you get the gene, you will get the Alzheimer, you will get Alzheimer's. Um, that's quite rare. The less than 1% of all, of all Alzheimer's would be under that kind of, of um, type. And these families are carefully studied, and, and, and um, we can refer you to, there, there's ways to get genetic testing, and then you would know um, for sure. There's a lot of ethics behind this, because some people want to know, some people don't want to know, but, but there are very clear ways to, to investigate that issue. 99% of Alzheimer's is not that, but it's slightly hereditary. In other words, um, if you have a family family member who had Alzheimer's later in life, you have a slight increased risk of having al of getting Alzheimer's, but it's not a one-to-one -one kind of thing. So, and that's probably a lot driven by apolipoprotein E or APOE. There's a, a type of, of um, lipoprotein, where and the certain variant confers greater risk for Alzheimer's, and that can be passed along in families. But again, most Alzheimer's is slightly genetic, I would say, just like a lot of other things are are slightly genetic. Um, you know, cancer might be, you know, but but it's not a one to one kind of thing. So in your case, I w I would recommend, um, you know, possibly looking into this further to to see which which camp you, you, your family might be in. And I would add to that, um, Christine mentioned <clears throat> APOE. So there's three types of APOE, APOE 2, 3, and 4. And from epidemiological studies, what's been shown is that the most common is APOE 3. About 70% of people have APOE 3, so that's normal risk. About 5% or maybe 10% of people have APOE 2. They're protected against getting Alzheimer's disease. 
and about 20% of people have ApoE4 in one form or another. And if you have two ApoE4s, one from mom and one from dad, your risk of getting Alzheimer's is like 10, 15 times the average population. This is a blood test that you can get at Quest or LabCorp. And about, so if you figure about 20% of people have the ApoE4 risk, 60% of people have Al uh, with ApoE4 have Alzheimer's. So they represent, for example, in clinical trials, we see that ApoE4 people are overrepresented in clinical trials because it's, it's a major genetic, a leading genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's. The problem is we've known about this risk for about 35 years, and we haven't been able to what's called drug it. In other words, how do we fix ApoE4 to reduce the risk that it creates? I mean, it does so many things in the body and in the brain. So how do we do the one thing that would reduce the risk of having an ApoE4 gene? And what we've done is put, spin out a company out of Weill Cornell in New York called Lexio, <clears throat> which just went public, um, to do gene therapy and create a virus that's non-infectious where you could put the DNA um, of the ApoE2 protective gene into the virus and that would be injected into the brain and the brain would start making ApoE2 and offset the risk of ApoE4. And so that was done in people, in, in, in monkeys and in preclinical research. They went to the FDA, they got FDA approval to go into people. They completed a phase one trial of this recently <coughs> which showed that in the spinal fluid you could see ApoE2 being generated, meaning the virus was working. There were no side effects and now the next phase would be a phase two study to look at efficacy. If I saw your family as a patient, what could I do simple that would help us understand your genetic risk? It would probably be to do an APOE gene typing. You can do it through Quest or LabCorp, and it's very simple. Um, it sounds a little unusual because someone in your family got it at age 35. Usually people with APOE4 get it. Not your side. <laughs> Howard, we have time for one more question. One more question. Anybody? Yes, sir. Where In terms of the question the gentleman was asking about a uh, preventive shot or a pill, don't you agree, though, that metformin, uh, cheap, readily available, uh, uh, taken prophylactically? I I'm not diabetic, but I've had my doctor pre prescribe that for the last nine years. Don't you think that goes towards that, even though it's far from perfect? Well, well we, we're, that's exactly what we're doing. We're asking that question in the Met Finger study out of, uh, coming out of Scandinavia. That's, we're adding met, metformin to the prevention regimen that Dr. Kivapelto is doing. And a lot of people want to take metformin for this purpose to prevent Alzheimer's, but we don't really have good data, I don't think, to, uh, to recommend that. Okay. All right, so, uh, for, yes. Now, doctors, fill it in, and Jaffe, before we let you go, I have one last quick question for both of you, uh, worth, to, worth to listen to this. Um, and let's start with you, Dr. Jaffe. Same question for both of you. Right now, sitting here today uh, in this wonderful Four Arts Club in Palm Beach, and you look out over the next two to five years, what are you most excited about in the field of Alzheimer's? I'm most excited about prevention. Uh, I think this idea that you can identify who might be at risk and then do something about it with a combination of lifestyle changes and drugs. So I'm extremely excited about prevention and I think we'll be there in five years. Not two, but five. Howard? Yeah, um, with 75% with of the new drugs being developed now in various whole array of pathways based on the biology of aging, I'm really excited about the next generation of drugs that will be developed and be efficacious, particularly those drugs that address the inflammation that's in the brain. And I think the next era, which we're beginning to embark on, <clears throat> will be what we call precision medicine with combination therapy. The best example of that is, is modern cancer treatment where we type the cells of the cancer patient, we find out where their risks are, and then we tailor 
the treatment for those patients with the various cancer drugs directed against their, their precision biomarkers. And that's, that's where our field is going. I think you're going to start seeing combination therapy just like we have in other in aging diseases like diabetes where people are on two or three or four medications. Hypertension, cancer, we're going to see people on with, with biomarker to, uh, characterized disease that will then be treated to the biomarkers, precision medicine, uh, with various drugs to do that. And I think that way we'll get to slowing it down 75, 80%, 100% in the next five years. We're going to make big progress, I think. So, yes. Here we go again. Want to just a couple of dates to ask you all to keep in mind. And before I do that, one more of our board members uh, is here today who I, I missed earlier. Bal Agarol, you're here, I know. There we go. Bal, great to have you with us. Um, I hope you can palpably feel how exciting this science is. And th there's a couple of things coming up that I just want to uh, underscore. First of all, March 13th is our annual Palm Beach Gala. Uh, Nancy Goods, who is with us today, we are honoring her. We are close to a sellout. So if you're interested in that, we're the world's leading expert on digital diagnostics, wearables, that can tell you if your cognition is slipping. You're not going to want to miss that. That's one. <laughs> Two, we have a fair amount of folks in the audience that are from the D.C. area. And there on March, uh, May 7th, we have the Great Ladies Symposium, Luncheon, and Fashion Show. First place you can go for um, science and Ca Carolina Herrera. So uh, a good time. I will tell you at that, and the one thing I'll hold up, this Lilly drug that's going to get the FDA clearance, their top executive in Alzheimer's, woman by the name of Ann White, she's going to be the featured scientific speech speaker there. So this newest drug that comes out, she'll be there to comment on. And then, of course, um, as Sophia said before, we were back here on February 28th at the Four Arts with the second in our science series, which is just about sold out. So uh, um, you, you want to jump on that quick. I, I hope you get from the time we spent today, and we're going to have time in a reception to ask the good doctors more questions, but a real insider's view into what in the next decade is the number one health issue of the next decade. And I would tell you and in, 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 implore you, ask you, join us at the ADDF, because here are all the things you get privy to. One, Dr. Fillett. <laughs> Concierge practice. <laughs> Two, I didn't ask for that. <laughs> donate. 100% of what you give goes directly, directly. You want the inflammation drug to come sooner? Donate 100% of it's going to go to that trial. The other piece that wasn't touched on so much here, but I want to bring up because there's a lot of folks with financial backgrounds in the room. There's a couple of folks who already do this with us. Um, if you're interested in investing, directly into companies in this area. We are a venture philanthropy. We can tell you the companies, the biotechs, the academics that are going to spin out to biotechs that have the most promising science that's there for you. So you're interested personally for yourself. You're interested in charitably moving the world. You're interested in your own portfolio. You can be part of us. And then today, I want to end on this join us. And I want to make a very, very, very fine point on this, because there was an interesting question before about, hey, that blood test, my doctor says you know, they don't want to get it for me. Um, I am in my mid, early to mid-60s. If my cognition starts going off tomorrow, I have options. Could not have told you that five years ago, but I have options. I have two wonderful children in their 30s. There is no question, and it's the science you heard about here, they, by the time they get into their 50s, 60s, 70s, will have prescriptions. And then, I have to brag, I have the most beautiful two grandsons. One's two and a half, one's one and a half. They will have, in their lifetime, because of the literally the science you're hearing about today, protocols. And so long as they stay on those protocols, they will always remember the names of their grandchildren. That is not hyperbole. This is fact. Join us. You can help us help this all go quicker. 
Thank you, and we're going to retire to the reception. And thank you to Four Arts.